Creative Insurgents. Creative Insurgents. Hey everybody, this is Corey Huff with TheAbundantArtist.com. And Melissa Dinwiddie with Living a Creative Life. And this is the Creative Insurgents Podcast. Where we are all about living a creative life by your own rules. Woohoo! <sighs> Speaking of living a creative life by your own rules, Melissa. Yes, Corey. I am looking out the window at uh, my uh, Paris skyline from Very my apartment. Nice. And I'm all hopped up on sugar because <laughs> today I have eaten two Magnum ice cream bars. They are oh. very popular here. Oh, yes. I remember those from my I'm, trips to Europe. I'm... Yes, I'm doing my best to be as Parisian as I can. Oh, I think it's absolutely it's required if you live in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have anything quite nearly as uh, exotic as Parisian ice cream bars, but I've been uh, creating up a storm. I've been making a new loop track every day that you can hear on my SoundCloud account or over at melissadinwitty.com slash loops. And I've been painting a lot and having great fun with that. And uh, I'm always happy when I'm creating. So life is good, even though I'm That's not That's fantastic. Paris. And you, you have this really cool thing coming up, which uh, is something that I could probably use. Y'all can't see the floor over here. So, well, <laughs> Melissa, don't you tell us about the Great Clutter Bust? Yes, I, I'm rerunning. I'm running the Great Clutter Bust again this year. I ran it in the spring and April, and I'm running a fall version. So if you have a closet of doom that has just been weighing on you or if you've got financial clutter that you need to deal with that's driving you nuts or digital clutter, any kind of clutter in your life that you are ready to release and let go, if it feels like an impossible task, the Great Clutter Bust will actually make it fun, amazing. That's that's what people said last time. That, that I. So many people posted in the Facebook group for the Great Clutter Bust. I can't believe clutter busting is fun, <laughs> but it is. Because <laughs> when you do it in community, awesome. it, it gets fun. So that starts on October 1st, and it's a four-week program to just blast through as much clutter as you are, as your little heart desires in four weeks with the support of a great and group. And where, where do we find out more about it? You can find about, out about it at melissadinwitty.com slash great-clutterbust. So, Melissa, why don't we introduce today's guests? All right, let's today's do it. Today's guest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody. Uh, today I want to introduce you to my friend Lisa Call. Uh, I met Lisa three years ago at the World Domination Summit, but actually that was the first time we'd met in person uh, Lisa is another uh, person that I've been following uh, online for a couple of years uh, before I before I actually met in person. Um, Lisa is an artist, a fabric artist, and pattern artist uh, based in Colorado, uh, in the United States, and she does amazing work. And uh, also, Lisa just left her day job a few months ago, so congratulations, Yay. Lisa! Yay! <laughs> yeah. Um, so today, I, we're going to talk, Lisa and I had the most interesting conversation at the World Domination Summit in Portland this uh, past summer, and I wanted to uh, bring Lisa on the Creative Insurgents podcast and just have that same conversation uh, so that people can hear it in public, because I think it's an important conversation to have. Lisa, thank you so much for, for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. So Lisa, we were standing in line uh, to get ice cream or something uh, at, at the World Domination <laughs> Summit. And and I leaned over to you and I said, how do you, like, like there's so many artists who who are financially and professionally very successful who you would never guess were artists, like just by, by looking at them. But then there are a lot of people who look like artists <laughs> who you would who you would think would be successful but really aren't. And, and we sort of had this conversation about what it means to be a professional artist versus what people think it means to be a professional artist. Yeah, I, I forgot that's how the conversation started. That was a great conversation. And it was, it was really about uh, being an artist isn't about what you look like. It's really about what you do when you go to your studio. It's about how focused you remain while you're in your studio, while you 
or you're looking to be a professional or just looking to look like an artist. Okay, done. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's absolutely true. I think a lot of artists are, and maybe a lot of us, a lot of people are very concerned with image. We want to look a certain way. We want to be perceived a certain way. The look and the, and the perception is not the reality of the situation. Lisa, I know that you, maybe you tell us a little bit for, for context for those who don't know you, Tell us a little bit about some of the courses that you teach and the work you do as a professional artist. So I am a, a textile artist, and I pretty much only work in a series. I've been working in the same series now for 10 years, and I find it interesting when I talk to people about that, and, and what it comes down to is that whole want to look like an artist, and one of the things that artists want to do is they want to look like they kind of can do everything, and, and that and, and that they don't focus. The artists have this um, mystique of, oh, I can't really focus, and I do this, and I flip around, and I do that, and I'm, I'm so not that way. I'm very, very much obsessed with one idea, this idea of connection and, and barriers and how um, we come together and, and, and how we don't let people know who we are, and that's what my series is about, and I've been working on it for 10 years. And so I have, uh, I don't know, 160, 170 pieces in the series that, that I've been working on. And so people would always ask me about it, so I started teaching a class called Working in a Series to, to help artists learn how to do that, to learn how to, to focus on one thing. And, and it's important to figure out what you're interested in in the first place. And once you find that, you can then get focused because in finding a gallery you have to have a you know a consistent body of work and working in a series is a great way of doing that so that's mostly what I teach and in that class it's really a lot I don't teach how to make art it's really a lot of mindsets how do you how do you stay focused how do you not get bored how do you how do you return to the same idea again when you would want to go off track because your friend did something that sounds more interesting than what you're doing. How do you get back to what you're doing and to trust yourself that what you're doing is interesting? That's uh, something that I think a lot of artists, especially newer artists, struggle with. Yeah, I, do, I think that a lot of artists get distracted by what is happening. In, their friends are doing it, they see someone do something on Facebook, and they're like, oh, that would be fun, I want to do that. And so they try that, and then, then they see someone else do something and they want to try that. And they never sit down and say, well, what do I really want to do? Yes, all those other people want to do those things, and they are interesting, but what's, what matters to you? And I know that not everybody loves my art. I don't, I don't look to please everybody, and I know that if I were to, um, to, to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, I would get a larger um, following. I would you know, have more people because I would have a greater variety so there would be more people but they would be only eh, okay that's interesting but the people that like my art they really like my art because it's very clear what my message is and I think having that very clear message really helps and 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 staying focused on that and not getting distracted by what other people are doing is hard I love it. I, <laughs> I, I think I, I feel like every artist needs to hear what you just said. And I think it's also important to um, to point out that everyone has to start out as a student. I spent um, maybe six to eight years uh, when I first decided, okay, I want to be a professional artist. I want to make a career of this. And I did kind of flit around, and I took classes, and I learned. I didn't go to art school, but I, I chose classes outside of art school to educate myself. And I tried different things. And... Um, as soon as I found the thing that really worked for me, I stopped taking classes and I and I got serious about what I wanted. And I think all artists kind of need to go through that period of doing some experimentation of I want to try this and I want to try that. And and that's when you're a student. And and I think really what happens is that artists go through this period where they're students either in art school or outside of art school. And they mistake this as a time when they should be showing and selling their work versus this is a time where you should really be experimenting and learning and figuring out who you are. And once you figure out who you are, then you focus, and then it's time to become a professional artist. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit of a, a needle in the, in the side here. <laughs> I, I think um, Lisa's way of doing things is brilliant, and I think it's clearly working for you, and I think it works for a lot of people. 
And at the same time, there are also people who need to continually be moving in new directions. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean that they're being unprofessional or flitty or um, dilettantish about it. Like, for example, take the music artist Sting, who whose styles of music have changed dramatically. And um, each time he's come out with a new style of music, his fans, a lot of his fans have been really upset because they're used to a particular way of, you know, they want this, they want more of the same, they want more of the same. But he, as a creator, needed to go in a new direction because he felt like, for whatever reason, he had said everything that he could, that he was interested in saying in this particular genre, in this particular style. So I'm curious what your take on that is, Lisa, because that's, I, as an artist myself, I feel like I agree with you that working in series, like I do work in series, but my series aren't 10 years long. They're maybe a year long or three months long. I want to I want to hear what Lisa has to say, but I want to point out that um, Melissa, you have like you, all these things that you've done in the last few years. You you're, you're definitely that multi potentialite, multi passionate person, but you also have uh, a foundation of a, a calligraphy and ketuba business that you had for years. Um, concurrent with and before all the stuff that you're doing now. Right, so you've got absolutely like sort of, true. You've absolutely got like true. a big body of work that that is, uh, or or for a long time was your main source of income, and allowed you to start experimenting in these other directions. Yeah, that's true. But if you, if, I mean, it's very funny because if you look at my body of work as a Ketuba artist, I don't have a single style. The only thing that is um, y uniting them together all of my ketubah pieces is that they are ketubah, that they're Jewish marriage contracts. I don't know. I think, I think it's a really rich area for conversation, and I would love to hear Lisa's, Lisa's thoughts about it. Yeah. So, so I actually think that um, a lot of people confuse working in a series with the idea that you're doing the same thing over and over again, and there is no growth, and that's... I spend a lot of time in my working in a series class talking about, you know, what is the definition of a series, and, and to me... I believe that it's not a series if it doesn't show growth. If it is the same thing over and over again, you've just done kind of a, this project. You just kind of said, and I do that. I, I'll go, I, I have a series of travel art, so I will you know, go to Thailand or go to Italy and I'll make a small series of work, but they all are kind of the same. It just kind of captures that moment in time when I was traveling. I don't view those as series. To me, a series shows evolution, it shows growth. And my example, like you have a sting, for me, for the visual artists that that I use is um, de Kooning. So de Kooning, if you take yeah. a look at his art, he um, he works exactly like you were talking about with Sting, or he did work. He would he would he would come up with an idea and he would make piece after piece to really understand it. You know, for example the black and white and all of the abstract expressionists were working with that those kind of black and white pieces and he and then he would kind of figure it out he'd like I got it I, I, I do this and now I don't want to do that anymore and so his his work would evolve and he went from abstract to representational work and, and back and forth again and some landscape in there but if you look at his work if you went to his retrospective at MoMA a few years ago and you walked through you could see he had some consistent lines in his work you could always see shapes he would use them um, tracing paper and he would use these shapes and you could see that he used them throughout his entire body of work and so he showed growth and he and he didn't work like today I'm going to do a woman piece and tomorrow I'm going to paint a landscape and then the next day I'll go back and do a black and white so he wasn't flitting around from one thing to another he was like had an idea he worked on it he got really serious about it he understood it and then when he understood it he moved on and if you look at my series um, the, the structure series that I was talking about, about 170 pieces, it has evolved significantly over the 10 years. And the work I do today doesn't look anything like the work I did previously. And to me, that would be very boring not to show growth. And so I consider a series is something that has growth, that shows growth, and that you don't know what the outcome is. I always know the outcome when I'm going to do, like, 
um, postcards from Italy. I know what the outcome is going to be. I'm going to do X number of pieces. They're all kind of going to look like this, and there's no growth there. It's it's a project. I I, I make this work, but I don't know where my my structure series will be a year from now. I can't predict where it's going to go, and that's the exciting thing to me is not knowing where it's going to go, but having a foundation that I I I have a starting point that I'm not facing a blank canvas. I'm I I have some ideas on what my series is about and that leads me to go forward. So it sounds like like the way that I work when I when I think of working in series, I really love your 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 personal definition of a project versus a series and how a series shows growth. I think that's really awesome. I notice when I work, I think about um, a series has a certain certain parameters around it. And I'm exploring within that set of parameters. And at a certain point, I might get bored with those, that per particular set of parameters. And just like de Kooning, not that I would compare myself with him, but just like de Kooning, <laughs> I might say, OK, now I'm going to work with a, di a different set of parameters. And maybe the parameters is I'm going to work on 5x5 five five canvas, um, or maybe the parameter is a certain colors, or uh, maybe the parameter is like right now I'm looping. That's my latest um, thing that I'm exploring is using my voice and just my voice to create compositions layer upon layer upon layer. So um, yeah, I think I think perhaps where I might differ from you, Lisa, is um, and maybe not. Maybe maybe I'm not differing from you. Is that uh, maybe it's a duration thing that like I know artists who started out in pastels or painting. And then at a, some point, at some point, they decided they really wanted to explore sculpture. And then they created a big body of work in sculpture. And then maybe they went back to the painting for a while and back and forth between the sculpture and the painting. Or I know artists like myself who explore in a variety of different areas that are seemingly unrelated. You know, visual art, music, writing, um, improv, whatever. And uh, I don't think it necessarily has to mean that you're a dilettante. Or that you're flitting around to do that. I think I think I think it's probably sort of a matter of wiring. Would the two of you agree that um, I, I think I think most everybody would agree that it's perfectly fine to experiment and try all kinds of different things, and that I think most artists who are who are like really born artists who have that that intrinsic artistic soul want to try lots of different things. Um, but for having a financially viable career having a solid series that, that has a, a, a long body of work, do you think that is a stronger contribution to a, to a financially stable artistic career? Yes. I would say that for sure. You know, and I think you have to establish your name at, at some point. And to establish your name, if you, if you don't have a voice and you don't have something that is unique about what you have to say, it's very hard to establish that name. And then it's very hard to then get a foothold to build a career on if you are never settled on one thing. Although I want to go back to something Melissa said, and um, I, I found some references when I, I gave a talk about working in a series a couple years ago, and I, have, I, I tried to find them before we talked, and, and this idea that we're wired differently, and introverts actually are able to focus more on um, and something about the, the, their brain chemistry, able to focus on one thing, more consistently. Extroverts are much more likely to do multiple things at a time. So there is just some different things about the way our brains work. Uh, you know, on the you know, on the Myers Briggs scale, I'm very far over on the introvert side. So I, you know, I know that that it um, that I, it, uh, that allows me probably in some ways to focus on um, one thing at a time and, and do and be really go into depth with it. But, you know, that isn't to say that I don't work on other series. I, you know, I do these projects, and I actually have three or four other series that are going at kind of the same time. So I, don't, I haven't just done that one series over the last 10 years. So for the artists who are thinking, okay, I want to I establish myself. I want to make a name for myself. I want to be known for something. How do you figure out what that something is going to be? Like, I, I tell artists all the time, you know, before, before you can really start to market yourself, you need a, a work, you need 20, 30 pieces or something that you can start to market yourself with. How do you decide what you're going to create 20 to 30 pieces of art about? That's a really good question. And um, 
I actually teach another class <laughs> called abstractions, which really is kind of about abstraction because everything's abstract, right? It, we're looking at um, the outside world, and as soon as we interpret it, we've abstracted it. And and so, I I viewed my two classes as kind of going together. I I was trying to encourage people to take my abstractions class first, and then take working in series because in abstractions we talk about. What are different ways of working? Do you work better improvisationally? Do you work better with a lot of planning and sketching? And I and I have people do that. I have them do um, assignments where they it's totally improv, and other assignments where I'm like uh, the the list of steps they have to go through is very painful. You know, just to see <laughs> <laughs> how much planning. And you know, I have them do quite a bit of planning, and at the end of the class, they're like. You know, they tend to fall one way or the other. People that had never done any sketching because they thought, oh, I don't know how to sketch and I don't know how to use sketches to inform my work. They they're like, I I found out that my work is better when I do all that, and you know, and so they they learn that, and then they find out that I don't do any sketching. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think it's very important to learn how to do that, to learn how to to um to work with some planning and, and and be thoughtful about it. And even if it isn't for you, it's important to try all these things out. And and then I and we also go through all the different ways of doing abstraction, from abstracting objects to abstracting ideas to doing non-objective abstraction. And usually from there, from those assignments, people usually have something that they've done over the eight assignments that are like, I want to do more of that. I can see doing more of that. So it's like they are. They then, you know, it's like this generation of ideas. I kind of, you know, generating this this warehouse of ideas, and they find something that's interesting, and then you take that to working in a series, and then you make a series with it, and then you have these other ideas that you can go back to. That you know, hey, I, I've tried this one. Let me go back and take another idea and work it through to a series. But I think. You know, taking a class like that where you're really figuring out how do I work best, because that's one of the keys is that even though you have an idea, well, how do you know how do you work best? Do you work better improvisationally, which is what I do. I don't nothing. I just go up there and do it. And Or do you work better by sketching, 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 and then using that to inform your work? That's an important thing to figure out, and all artists work very differently. Yeah, that's such a great point, Lisa. I think that it's so important, as you said, to figure out how you you like to work and also one of the things that underlying everything you just said is doing it is trying it we you can't figure out what you want to do just by thinking about it you have to right. do it that's what's going to bring the ideas forward and that's what's going to show you what you like and what you don't like right absolutely yeah. how do you distinguish between an idea that will get you a few pieces and be mildly interesting and an idea that will burn a hole in your skull and get you 170 pieces in 10 years. And you know, you really have to do it. And it's interesting, about halfway through um, my working in a series class, I, a, a, a percent of my students will kind of hit a wall. And they, they're, so then I, you know, we, we have we have one-on-one -on -one calls because I know about when that's going to happen. When they're either they hit a wall because they really picked an idea that didn't interest them and they're bored already because they've done three pieces and they they've had enough. And so then I help them pick something else. And, and I can usually tell the difference between that and they just don't really know how to move forward and they just need to get unstuck. And and it's pretty clear to me usually by the way they write about their work. My students have to do so much writing because I think that we learn so much about writing when we write. And and you know even though it's a, an art class, writing. But I'm a visual lots, artist. I don't want to write. Lots of writing. Lots of writing. I mean, learning how to critique your own work is so invaluable. But you know, and I can tell by the way they they write, and then you talk to them, and you can tell by the tone of voice if they're really excited about it, and they're just stuck or they're scared, or, oh my gosh, this idea just wasn't interesting. And what that's actually one of the, the, the challenges I have in teaching this class is that I, I encourage them to don't pick an idea for a class. So they don't think I'm saving my good ideas for later, because mm -hmm. if we look at um, the um, Ocean Park series that Diebenkorn did, if you look, his first four or five pieces of this series are gone. He destroyed them. We can't, no one has seen them. He didn't photograph them. No one knows what they look like because it was a, he had just gone from doing his landscape work to doing this abstract work, and and the first few pieces are beginner work. They are, you don't know what your series is, and 
And so I pretty much encourage everyone that makes the work in during the class, you're probably going to you know toss that out. And the real series starts when the class is over. So I really encourage people to pick something that you're passionate about. And I can sometimes tell where they're kind of holding back and they don't want to pick that idea because they're so afraid that they'll ruin it or you know let me save the best idea for later and and that's that's something I think we all do as artists you know we get these supplies that we are enamored with or we have these colors that we're excited about and we think oh I'm not ready for that yet I don't I might be really passionate about it right now but I, I'm afraid I'll ruin it so I won't do it and from the textile world a lot of us it's you know you have a beautiful piece of fabric so let's save it and uh, and then and you save it, and then five years later, you think, oh my gosh, that's really ugly, or I'm not interested in that idea anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's, such, it's, it's like you have to, like, when you're passionate about something, you need to take action on it then, not save it for when you think you're ready for it, because you have the passion, and you need to work when you have the passion. Well, and as they say, paint is only wasted when it stays in the tube, and paper is right. only wasted when it stays in the drawer. <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly. You said something that you know that you have students write, and you can tell when they're sort of hesitant, um, and they're not going deep enough. Like, so I, I experience this a lot with artists who might have a body of work, but they're struggling to understand how to market themselves. Uh, they don't know how to talk about their art. What are some ideas that artists can have on on how to understand? your own work a little better so that you can so that you can talk about it a little better. I think the only way to figure that out is to write. I don't think there's any other way to figure it out. I think it, it um, as much as we want to believe we're visual artists, it's the writing that helps. It um, because we cannot communicate with just our art. As much as we want people to just look at it and go, that's what it is, and then you should get it, we need words. And and figuring out those words only happens when you come up with complete sentences. When when we have it going on in our head, those are not complete sentences. They're just ideas. And the and they aren't spoken and they aren't written and they and then when someone asks you, you think, well I had an idea but I didn't really figure out what that was because it was never a complete sentence. It was just some words up there that didn't make sense to someone else. So you have to I think you have to write it down. You have to spend a lot of time writing, a lot of time journaling, a lot of time just doing free writing. Give yourself a prompt of I love connection because and then just write for 15 minutes, set the timer and write. And and don't worry about what is what you come up with. It doesn't have you're not going to write an artist thing. You're just going to write a bunch of words. And over time all of that writing turns into, hey, I now I, I understand my art better. I can communicate it, like with real words. <laughs> Just kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. so, so there's there's a tendency that I see in a lot of artists, visual artists, musicians, whoever, to, to write a, a couple sentences about what they do and then and then you know they'll say, oh you know I made this painting because the car in the in the street reminded me of my parents car when I was a kid and then they start talking about the technical how they made the painting right yeah right? they think that's writing about their work I spend a lot of time you know basically teaching students how to write a real art critique you know there's four sections you have to describe the work you have to analyze it you have to interpret it and then you can judge it and in none of those sections does it say how did I make it no one cares you know the only person that cares is the other artist but no one else cares how you made it so you can't so I spend a lot of time helping um, artists take the how I made it out of their writing because it's it doesn't help it doesn't help to say that stuff and, and I think we use it as a crutch to not go to that deeper level but that and I think the hardest part of the whole writing or critique is describing our own work how do you write in words what you see you know it's it's purple and it's got these black lines and there's a section of her it, it feels weird to say that and then so we like dive right into the technique and then so I painted it with this kind of paint and and it's like we lose the idea that we're describing something that's visual and and so we spend a lot of time on that I like the first couple of critiques people write we, I spend a lot of time getting some of that useless technique out of the writing because it doesn't help. Now that doesn't say that in my artist statement I do have a section that explains how I make my work but it's like at the, it's the last part. It's like the least interesting part of it but people do still want to know kind of how you do it especially something different like fiber which is not paint and so I have a little bit of 
how I do it, but the rest of it isn't about how it's made. Yeah, I was going to say, um, if, if you're a representational artist and you're, or you're a songwriter or something and you're telling a story with your song or you're, you painted a picture of a car, then the natural, like from a reader's perspective, the natural thing would be, oh, tell me more about that car that you loved when you were a child. Do you have a story about it? What, what did you do with that car? Did you sit in the back seat when, you know, da da da? Right. And but I think the challenge, the more of a challenge comes with abstract pieces, which don't always come from, a, 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 we're not always aware of a story when we're creating something abstract. It's just what happened to emerge in that particular moment and how can you find the story inside of that I think is the challenge often. It is. That is a really big challenge. It's really hard. It took me two years to figure out what my series is about. It, um, you know, I knew it was about walls and fences. Originally it was, you know, a picture of a fence that started it all out. But where, you know, it's just a lot of writing and, and before that they can figure out the stories. And what's really interesting with abstract work in fact, all artwork, I think, is that when I look back, I can identify what was happening in my life at the time. You know, here's, you know, I'm making art for a Christmas show, and I look back now and I think, hmm, it's all black. Why would I make black art for a Christmas <laughs> show? <laughs> it, was, it was a couple months after my dad had passed away, so of course that's what I was doing, and I didn't intentionally sit out to do it. It just happened, and, you know, it's like I, I have these pieces that I can identify. It's like, oh, well, that was the divorce piece. Obviously, that's what it was. It was also black, so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so it's very interesting how I can see... Um, the things in my life are, are directly related to what's happening in the art, and so those stories are great to, you know, that you can see what's happening as you're making this abstract art, and you can see how that impacts the art. It helps identify sort of where it's coming from, too. I, I really love, you know, watching my students evolve. And, you know, I've got some students I've worked with them for a couple years now, because after they take my classes, we have kind of these year-long programs, and the how they are, their stories have evolved about their work because they do so much writing. It's just beautiful, some of the things that they come up with and how it's very personal. It's usually a very personal story that this abstract art comes from, and it, it takes a while to identify what that story is. We're, we're just about out of time, Lisa, but before we end, I want to ask you, what does it mean to live a creative life on your own terms? What do you think of when I ask you that question? I... I have filtered out all of those voices that tell me that I, what I'm doing is wrong. Not, it's not that I don't have doubts, but that I am, I am honest with where I'm going, that I'm very authentic in my choices, and that, you know, I, I know that, you know, working on the same series for 10 years in a row is a very rare thing, and, but I keep doing it because for me that's what works. And, and for, um, you know, quitting my day job and, 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 and doing my own thing has been has been huge for um, for me to to live on my own terms to do what I want no more sitting in a cubicle doing what someone else told me to do. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, Lisa. Lisa Call, it's, it's been a pleasure. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Melissa, for doing that. That was really cool. It was fun to take a conversation that I had months ago and uh, bring it up to now and let everybody hear about it. So thanks again, Lisa. We appreciate you being on the show. So if you like this episode, leave us a review on iTunes. We might even read your review and your name online. We have a review here from Titan Phil. Titan Phil writes, thank you so much for creating this show. I discovered your podcast through Pat Flynn SPI podcast. I'm a working Disney artist who is used to creating art that is conformed to a certain style. Although I love what I do, it's so refreshing to hear fellow artists discuss creativity outside of the box and artistic freedom. I listen to the show while I work and feel like I'm part of the group. Keep up the good work and passing on such informative information. Ooh, that's such a great review. Thank you so much, Titan Phil. Thanks a lot, Titan Phil. We really appreciate it. And if you appreciate the Creative Insurgents podcast, we would love it if you would leave a review. You can go to creativeinsurgents.com for a link to our show on iTunes and leave us a review there. And you can also subscribe to the audio or the video of the show automatically on iTunes. And again, if you leave us a review, we may just give you a mention on the air. Thanks again for joining us, everybody. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good day.